Welcome everybody to the class for the Bernina 770 Quilters Edition Plus. The same information will also work with the standard 770. Now in this class, we are gonna take you through all of the functions of the machine. We are going to go from winding the bobbin to using the needle threader to what every button feature and function of the machine does. Now, at the end of this video, we are going to then do the maintenance section of the machine. The maintenance section is very, very, very important. So please watch the entire video or go to the maintenance section and just watch that part as needed because you have to do that in order for the machines to, to function properly. So let's get started now. We're gonna get started with the bobbin winding. All right, to wind the bobbin, we are going to use the spool pin on the sewing machine. From the spool of thread, we are going to go into the first guide towards the back of the machine. Then we're going to go around the bobbin winder, pulling tightly around this little button guide. Now we're gonna place our bobbin onto our bobbin winder. The bobbin will only go on the bobbin winder one direction. If you try to put it on upside down, it will not fit. So the silver marks on the bobbin goes downward. You're going to take your thread, wrap it around the bobbin a few times, and then we can cut it off at the little razor that's in the back of the switch. When we engage that switch, the bobbin will start to wind. The bobbin will completely fill and shut off on its own. If you need to shut it off before it is all the way filled, you can just pull this arm back, but we are gonna let this bobbin fill completely. Now these are large bobbins, so they do hold more thread than your traditional sewing machines bobbins will hold, and they hold more thread than the previous model Bernina's in the past. So now that it has turned off, we can remove the bobbin, cut it off on the little razor blade there, and now we are ready to insert the bobbin into the bobbin casing. All right, so now we are going to insert our bobbin into our bobbin casing. So we will open up the door on the front where the bobbin case is located. There is a little release latch, this piece of metal here. There's a little push spot on it. So when we push that, the bobbin case will then come out of the machine. So when the bobbin case comes out, we then can take the bobbin and it'll only fit into the bobbin casing one way, the proper way. If I try to put it on upside down, it simply will not fit into the bobbin case. So the silver parts go inward. We go in to the bobbin case. We bring the thread into this first little slit right here. And now we're gonna pull the thread underneath this flat piece of metal until we get to this metal finger sticking out the top of the bobbin case. The thread clicks all the way into that piece until the thread is coming out of the top of that metal finger. When the thread is coming out, now we can insert it into the machine. To insert it into the machine, the metal finger is gonna be in the um, upward direction, but I like to point out the metal release latch here will be horizontal when you insert it into the machine. So you just give it a push and it has locked into place. We take our thread tail and we cut it off at the razor blade, close the door. Now our bobbin is completely loaded. All right, so now we are ready to thread the top of the sewing machine. Really quick, I wanna talk about these spool caps. So the machine comes with three different size spool caps, and that is because all, all different threads come in different shapes and sizes. And so we wanna make sure that our spool cap matches the shape and type of spool that we're using. You, we wouldn't necessarily wanna have a, a larger spool with a small spool cap, just in case the ends of the spool of thread might have some rough, sharp spots on it. And as the thread is falling off, they may get snagged on those. So when we have a spool cap that is slightly bigger, it'll keep the thread from getting snagged on those. So that is why we have different size spool caps. So you can match it to the thread that you're gonna work with. 
So the thread is going to go onto the spool pin of the sewing machine. We push our spool cap and we want to push it all the way on so that there is no gaps in these areas. If there is gaps, the thread will most likely get stuck in those gaps. So all the way on, we are going to take our thread and we're going to come back here to this first metal guide where we're going to click into the guide, just kind of hooks underneath it and comes to the top. Now that we're up here, we can come down the groove in the front of the machine and there is arrows printed on the machine showing us the direction to go. So we're going to come down the front. Now this silver piece here, when we get to the bottom, we are going to wrap around that silver piece and we're going to come all the way back up to the top of the machine. Now in this spot is our take up lever. That is the metal lever that moves up and down when the machine sews and it's pulling the thread up. So it's imperative that we get into this lever. So we are going to go all the way to the back of this slot as far as it'll go. And then we're going to pull back forward and that will make the thread slip into that take up lever. And it actually has a lock on it. So when it pops into that take up lever, it locks itself onto that lever. So from there, we're going to come straight down the front of the machine. And now I'm going to reposition the camera. Now that we have come down the front of the machine, I can take the thread and it slips behind this little guide right here. And then there's another one right here on the needle clamp. It is just going to slip right behind there. Just like that. And now I'm going to use the needle threader to thread the machine. After I do this, we are going to get a close up view of how to use the needle threader. All right, and now we are threaded. And there's a little side cutter on the side where I can cut off the thread. All right, so now we are going to use a needle threader again. I know I've already done it, but I'm going to take the thread back out of the needle because I want you to really understand how this needle threader works. It's a, it's a really great needle threader that Bernina has on their machines. Um, but it is a it is a semi automatic, meaning that you are still involved with clicking the thread onto it. One thing that I really appreciate about this needle threader is when I bring it down, you'll notice that the presser foot drops down for me automatically. And that also if the needle rotation was wrong, meaning the hand wheel got turned, it would readjust that needle for me also. So it kind of takes care of getting everything lined up right. So now we're going to take the thread. And if you look on the needle threader, there is this first piece of plastic here that sticks downward. So we're going to bring the thread from behind it and over the front of it. Just like that. Now its job, that first little downward poking piece of plastic, what it does is it takes the thread from being vertical and makes it go horizontal. So now that I have the thread horizontal, I can bring the needle threader all the way forward and I'm going to do this by pulling down on this black arm and I need to push it down fairly firmly. I find that a lot of people will push it about to this point and they'll feel resistance and they'll stop pushing. Well, that's not far enough. So we need to give it an extra push until the needle threader has completely um, engulfed the needle. Basically, the needle is now inside of the needle threader. So now that that has happened, there is a slot right here that the thread goes into and I pull all the way back to the back end of that slot. And then I just lift up slightly on the thread and that's going to help it stay into the needle threader hook. And then as I release my grip here, I also have to release my grip on the thread because if I'm still holding that thread really tight, well, I'm going to be fighting against the needle threader that is now going to pull the thread through the, the eye of the needle. So now, now the needle threader pulls a nice loop behind the needle that you grab with your fingers and then you pull it through the rest of the way. And then I can cut it off on the side cutter. I'm gonna talk really quick though, um, before I move on about the do's and don'ts of needle threaders, because there's definitely some do's and don'ts. One is if I tried to use my needle threader and it didn't work the first time. Well, I might, I might try it a second time and see. 
If it didn't work the second time, I will absolutely not try it a third time. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check my needle. So I'm gonna take the needle out and I'm gonna put it back in because there is a good chance that when I changed my needle, I might not have gotten it all the way up in the clamp. If it's not all the way up in the clamp, of course, the hook of the threader will not line up with the eye of the needle and then it is going to bend the wire. So we do not want that to happen. So I want to double check my needle and if it still doesn't work after double checking your needle, throw that needle away maybe or, or set it aside, get another needle out, put it back in the machine because it could just be that that needle was bad. Also, needle threaders really work best with size 80 needles, 80 12s and above. They, you can use them on a size 70, you can, but that is your borderline, that is your cutoff. That eye of the needle is about the same size as a hook that needs to go through it. So that's gonna be your cutoff. Anything under size 70, we do not use the needle threader. All right, now we're gonna go through the front buttons on this sewing machine. So we're gonna start with the, the lower buttons. I like for people to get uh, familiar with these because it's a, it's a little different if they've had um, older model Bernina's, um, things have definitely changed quite a bit. One big outstanding change is there is no lifter lever on this machine. So you do not manually lift, uh, raise and lower your presser foot. It is all gonna be done automatically for you. The one thing that I wanna point out is that any time that I touch my foot on the foot control, the presser foot will drop down against the fabric. So if I hit my foot on the foot control, the presser foot will drop down and it'll start to engage sewing. If my presser foot is up and I just give my foot control a very short touch, it will not start sewing, but it'll lower my presser foot for me. So the presser foot does drop down automatically with the use of the foot control. But we also have buttons to raise and lower the presser foot. So I'm gonna to go to the second button first. So we're gonna skip this one for a second. We're gonna double back to it. So the one that has the presser foot with the arrows going up and the arrow going down, this is to raise and lower your presser foot. But I gotta explain something here because it can be a little bit confusing to people. So when I hit the button to lower the presser foot, the presser foot does not lower all the way against the fabric. It hovers above the fabric this is so that you can position the fabric where you want the needle to start sewing. And then when you get the needle lined up just where you want it to start, then you can hit the foot control. And of course, the foot control is going to put it down the rest of the way and start sewing. But this can be confusing to people because they expect when they hit this button that the presser foot is going to go all the way down against the fabric. When I hit the button a second time, of course, the presser foot does raise up. So that is how we raise our presser foot. So now if you do want your presser foot to go all the way down against your fabric, that is what you can use this button for. So this button actually does a few different things. So the first thing that it does is if I give it a, a touch, a one touch, you'll notice the presser foot is all the way down against the fabric. So use this button if you want your presser foot to go completely against the fabric. If I hit this button, a second time, that is when the presser foot will jog up slightly. So now it has jogged up so I can reposition it to start sewing. And of course, I can just simply hit the foot control to put it down the rest of the way to activate the sewing. So presser foot up. This one will lower the presser foot. This one will also jog the presser foot up. Another thing that this button does is this button will start running the sewing machine without the use of the foot controls. So this is also our start and stop button. So if your foot is getting tired and it needs a break, you can switch to using this button. And how this works on this machine is in order to use the start stop feature, you have to then hold the button down and that will activate the needle moving. So to do this, what I would do is I would set my speed slider right here to set the speed to a comfortable speed to sew at, I would hold this button down and then the needle would start sewing. If you hit the button again, of course the needle's gonna stop sewing. But I wanna point out one other thing, is the start stop feature on this machine works a lot like cruise control in the car. So when I start the machine sewing by the use of a button, 
Anytime I touch my foot on my foot control, my foot control will take back over. So you don't have to panic that you need to find the button again to stop the sewing process. So I will demonstrate here. So if I hold the button down and the machine starts sewing, I'm gonna to touch my foot now on the foot control and my foot control is taken back over and has stopped the machine from running. So just like cruise control in the car, when you're on cruise control, as soon as you touch the brake, right, the cruise control turns off and your gas pedal takes back over. So same, same thing there. So those, just to recap, press the foot up and down. This one will lower the presser foot on the fabric. This one will jog the presser foot up slightly to reposition. And if you hold it down, it'll start the machine sewing. Okay, so now we have our scissor button. So our scissor button is gonna do what you think. So when you sew to the end of your fabric, you can stop, hit your scissor button. It is going to cut your both your top and bottom threads. You pull the fabric out and then you can see it's trimmed. And now I can just reposition and start sewing again. Now, these buttons on this machine, this machine is highly customizable. So there's a, there's a lot we can customize on this machine and we'll get into that a little bit later in the video. But for instance, one feature we can customize with the scissor button is I can tell the machine every time I touch the scissors to cut my threads, I'm gonna have you do a lock stitch for me first. And you can even tell the machine the kind of lock stitch you want the machine to do. Do you want it to go forward and back? Do you want it to do stitching in place? So uh, if I program the machine that way, when I hit the cut button, it's gonna go lock stitch, and then it's gonna cut for me. So really nice that we can program these machines. Now, the reverse here does what you think. It's going to reverse while you're holding down the button. So sew so forward, hold the button down, and it'll it'll reverse for us. So it'll do the back stitch, um, the back stitch function. The reverse also has some special programming that you can do. We can do something called um, back stepping. I prefer back stepping because when you have set your reverse to do back stepping, what it means is that when it's stitched forward, um, it you know it. it landed in certain spots. And when it's stitching back, it's going to go back into those exact same holes that the needle hit going forward so that your stitch looks perfectly uniform back as it does forward. So that's that's backstepping. Otherwise, reverse just kind of goes where, where wherever reverse goes. So I actually prefer to turn on the backstepping when I'm programming my, my personal machine. So that is these buttons here. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the buttons up. So I got to reposition the camera. Okay, so now we have the, the upper buttons right here. So I positioned this so you can see both the screen right here and this button because I wanna talk about these, these two for a moment. Um, this is a needle up down button. So when I hit this button, the needle is gonna go down into the fabric and if I hit it again, it's gonna come up out of the fabric. This is a one time needle up down. So if I need to, if I'm doing free motion quilting and I need to pull my thread up to the top, I can use the needle up down there. Um, but it, it does not turn on the default, meaning that this is not how you set the machine to always stop needle down or always stop needle up. That is actually done here. So you'll notice this button has the needle that's up out of the fabric, which is represented by that line. So if it's showing above, that means it is stopping up with the needle in the up out of the fabric position. If I hit this button now, um, it is going to stop always with the needle in the fabric. So of course we can do turns. This is also a customizable feature on the machine. And, and we're gonna go in a little while, we'll get to the spot where we're gonna customize some of this and you'll see what I mean about this feature. But so this is the default, meaning this is you're activating it for the machine to always do needle up or always do needle down. And this one is a one-time needle up down. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by the one-time needle up down. So, um, sorry, let me go back to the straight stitch. I had played around with the different stitch a second ago. So this is my needle up down. So if I hit the button, every time I hit the button, the needle's gonna go in the fabric. I hit it again, the needle's gonna come out of the fabric. But if I'm sewing, the needle is still stopping out of the fabric every time. Unless then I selected the other button that was on the display, now the needle is always gonna stop down in the fabric. 
So again, this is a one-time needle up, down. Okay, so now this other one right here, this is a pattern restart feature. So if we are doing a pattern stitch, so let's say we are, are stitching a, a pretty little heart so uh, or a flower or something kind of cutesy. I'll, I'll actually go back to the flower I was doing a minute ago. So if we start sewing a row of these flowers and let's say we ended our row and we didn't complete the flower and now we are going to reposition the fabric then to, re to, to start sewing a new row of the pattern then we could hit this button and it's going to always jump us back to the beginning of the pattern. So it takes us right back to the start. It's a pattern restart button. So that's what the pattern restart is. This guy right here is our automatic lock stitch feature to the machine. So anytime, I'm just going to go really quick back to a straight stitch. So anytime that I hit this button, the first thing that happens when I start sewing is it's going to lock stitch for me. So this is instead of having to hit the reverse and do a back stitch, the machine will automatically take care of that back stitch function just by simply touching this button. Now, when you get to the end of your seam, then you can also touch the button again at the end, and then it'll do the lock stitch for you automatically at the end. And this lock stitch is um, also customizable, so we can tell the machine how we want the lock stitch to perform. So how many times it's going to lock, what kind of lock it's going to do. Um, so that's one of the things we can also customize. Now this button next to it is a stop feature, um, and this is also a customizable feature. So we can use this a few different ways, uh, and it depends on how we've programmed the machine. So this is this machine actually just came out of the box, so it's still programmed how it is from the factory. We haven't changed any of the programming on the machine yet. Um, so when I'm sewing with this, if I'm doing a regular straight stitch and I'm sewing and I hit this button, it is going to then stop and it's going to cut for me as if I hit the cut button. But if I'm doing a bigger pattern, so let me go back to that same flower. So if I'm doing this flower and I start sewing the flower and I touch this button, it is going to wait until that flower is done. Now the flower is completely done before it stopped and it cut. So now you can see I have a completed flower. You can also touch it at the beginning of sewing a pattern to only get the one pattern. So when I hit this button on the screen, you actually see that there is a stop sign here meaning that it is going to stop after every pattern. So after every flower, it is going to stop. So this is a stop function, but it can be used for a few different things. So it's kind of a, I call it more of a multi-function button because we can program it in different ways. And we're going to later on, so you can see what I mean, because it could end up being your favorite button. It is actually one of my favorite buttons to use when I'm doing just regular sewing. And of course, right here, this is just speed control. So speed down. Speed up, it just limits how fast the machine will run. Okay, so now we get to get over and play with our screen. All right, now we are going to go through the display. Um, we are gonna start on this left-hand portion of the display, starting with the top icon, and we're gonna work our, our way down, and then we'll work through the rest of, of the display. Um, at this top section of the display, we have the automatic tension setting for the machine. So right now when we're on a straight stitch, that number is 5.25. That's just the normal tension for the straight sewing on this machine. This machine has electronically controlled tensions. So the machine is gonna automatically set the tension based on the stitch or the function that we are doing in the machine. If we decide that we want to change the tension or override the tension, we can select the tension button there, that icon. And then we get a slider here on the machine where we can bring the tension up or we can bring it down and adjust that if we want to. We can also adjust it by hitting the plus and minus, or we can turn the big physical dials on the side of the machine and that will adjust it up or it'll adjust it down. So this is the tension um, part of the machine. So I, I just want to tell you with the tensions on the machine is 
You can adjust these all you want because you're not permanently changing the tension settings on the machine. So you don't have to worry about playing with this setting that you're going to permanently make some changes. It, this is only while you are sewing for that day. So if you turn the machine on and off, it, of course, it's going to reset back to normal. Any time that I touch the yellow box here, which will take it straight back to its default setting, anytime you change it off of default, it will always turn yellow. Also, the number in this corner will turn yellow just to let you know that you changed it off of where the machine normally sets it. So to get back really quickly, you just touch that and it gets you back there. I also like to talk about tensions, though, is we, we can adjust our tensions when our machine is working properly, meaning that everything is sewing fine and it looks good and, and, it's, and it's normal. Um, we don't want to adjust tensions when our machine's not functioning because that is never going to fix the problem. So for instance, if, if we put thread in our machine and we start sewing and, and we got these big loopy stitches on the underside of the fabric, well, guess what? Playing with our tension is not going to solve that problem. That is not a tension problem. That is usually a setup issue. Uh, a thread did not lock in somewhere when we were threading the sewing machine. So don't change your tensions. The tensions, again, are for when the machine is working properly. And let's say we've really mismatched our thread and we've got a really thick red thread on the top and we've got a really lightweight you know, uh, green thread in the bobbin and we're noticing a little bit of that green on the top or a little bit of the red on the underside and we're just gonna fine tune it a little bit. So that's fine. Yeah, do that all, all you want because that's why we have the attention adjustment. So again, we don't adjust this when things aren't working in the machine because that will not solve the problem. So that is our tension setting on the machine. So you can adjust it all you want and it's not going to be a permanent change and you can hit the middle there to get back to the default. All right, so the next one down that looks like a needle, this one and the one that looks like a stitch plate actually take you to the exact same location. So you'll see what I mean. So when I hit this button, it's going to open up this screen. When I hit the button of the stitch plate, it is also going to open up that exact same screen. So it is a little bit redundant, but um, but the reason why they broke it up is there's two different uh, settings that are going on or two different menus that are happening in this same screen. We've got our needles and we've got our stitch plates. So to try to make it a little bit easier for people, they did break it up into two buttons, even though it does take you to the exact same place. So what is happening here when we select, when we click on our needle here, this takes you to all the needle settings for the machine. So for the most part, we're going to be using a, a single needle, straight stitch, or not just a straight stitch, but just a one needle in the machine. So that's that's our common, typical setup here. These other needles are going to be different kinds of twin needles. And, they, and you'll notice there's different sizes associated with the twins, because when you buy a twin needle, they come in different sizes or different widths spacing the two needles apart. So one millimeter would be the two needles are really close. And then uh, like an eight millimeter would be the two needles are really far apart, eight millimeters apart. So different twins. We've got a triple needle. So three, we got wing needles. We got a wing needle with a single needle. So we got a lot of different needles going on here. So if you are working with a twin needle, I highly recommend telling the machine you're working with a twin needle because a few th different things happen. So let me close this menu and you'll see what it looks like on the screen. So first, we see two rows of stitches side by side now on the screen. So it's going to show us exactly what's going to happen when we sew on, on the machine with this size twin needle. If it was a different size, they would be closer together. But the reason why we really want to do this is the machine starts limiting some of its features to make sure that you don't go beyond the limits of the twin needle. So for instance, if I decide I want to zigzag with my twin needle, well, the machine will not zigzag wider than we can do with the twin needle. You'll see as I try to make the zigzag wider, it turns red and it will not let us sew because we have gone beyond the limits of that twin needle. This is a safety feature so that we don't accidentally break that twin needle while we're sewing because it starts hitting the edges of our stitch plate because we've gone too wide with our width. But the nice thing too is it now gives us a lot of freedom. It gives us the freedom to start playing around with our twin needle and getting a little bit more creative and hitting different um, stitches to get different decorative appearances 
with our twin needle. So you can get really, really fun and creative with a twin needle where we couldn't necessarily do that in the past. So let's go back to a straight stitch and we're gonna go turn that twin needle off. So we're gonna go back to the regular needle setting there, which is the first one. Now we have this one over here that has the needle with the bow on it. This is a really cool feature also I like. So when we are changing the needles in our machine, it's really hard to identify what kind of needle it is once you've taken a needle out of the machine. Now, some of the needle manufacturers are getting uh, a little bit smarter on the way they used to do things and now they're color coding needles. But again, you have to know what all the color codings mean to be able to identify that needle. So what you can do now is if, let's say we are working on a piece of stretch fabric, you know, spandex or something, and we put in a stretch needle size 70. We put that in the machine. So what we can do is we can come here, we can hit this little one with the bow on it. And now we can, we have all these different needle choices. So we can go through all the needle choices and we can find the one that we just put in the machine. We can select that needle, then we can select the size. Now, when we go later on to take that needle out and we wanna put it away, we can identify what that needle was if we if maybe it's two months later and we're getting back to it by looking at our chart now it shows us what needle that we had selected to that was in the machine so i really like this i think it's a very smart clever way for us to keep track of our needles okay so the next button down right here um that says one c on it that is our presser foot button. So the, the presser feet have these little sensors on the side so that the machine has the ability to know what presser foot is on the machine. You still have to go into our presser foot menu and then you can select the foot that you want to work with. Some of the feet do not have jewels on them meaning they don't have the sensor. So then on those feet, of course, we want to make sure that we're selecting that foot so that we are telling the machine this is the foot that we're going to be working with so that the machine can do some adjustments or just to make sure that you're not doing things wrong, like trying to zigzag with a straight stitch foot and so on and so forth. So, so this is our foot selector. So if I'm using my 1C foot, of course, you know, I'm going to have my 1C foot uh, selected and then we can close that. So that is our, our foot selector. Now the one below that, that says 50, that is our foot pressure. So that is the downward force that the presser foot is pushing against the fabric. So there is times where I want might want to increase that force to have it push down even harder against the fabric, or I might want to lessen that. So sometimes I will lessen the foot pressure, maybe when I have some really uneven fabric things where I've got a lot of hills and valleys and awful seams to climb over. If I take and lessen the foot pressure, I'm, it's going to mean the foot is going to push not as hard against the fabric. And a lot of times I can help it along and have it kind of glide over those seams for me. So again, on these menus to get back to the normal setting, I can just hit that little middle button and it'll take us right back to the normal setting if we did happen to change those settings. So the next one down here that says nine mm, that's nine millimeters, that is the stitch plate, the needle plate that is on the machine. So when we select this, we have different needle plate options. So the nine millimeter is our standard one that we use for most of our sewing, you know, straight stitch, zigzag, decorative stitches. A real common one would be, especially if you're a quilter or if you work on really sheer fabrics, you could switch to your straight stitch plate. So when I do select that I have a straight stitch plate, the straight stitch plate does say zero millimeters. It means the needle can move zero side to side instead of the nine millimeter width that the needle can move side to side. So when I do select this particular plate, the straight stitch plate, and I try to zigzag or do other stitches that the machine does, you will notice that the machine will only ever straight stitch because 
I cannot zigzag when I have a straight stitch needle plate on the machine. So it is a safety feature. So if you notice over here, our machine says zero mm in yellow. That is a reminder that we have a straight stitch plate on the machine that we have changed from what would be the normal default plate, which would be the nine millimeter plate. So then to get back to normal, I click this and I click the nine millimeter plate. And of course there's other optional plates that you can get, cut work plates, um, five millimeter plate, meaning that you cannot zigzag wider than, than five millimeter. But the two standard ones that most people are going to be working with are gonna be the nine or the zero. So the next button down, the one that looks like a straight stitch and a zigzag. So if I touch this button, the machine is, wanna, is going to want to go into a darning or free motion mode. So it's gonna allow me then to sew with the feed teeth in the down position. So if you notice in the video that plays as soon as I hit that, um, that button here, the straight stitch and zigzag button, um, the video is going to show us lowering the feed teeth by hitting that button on the side of the machine so that the feed on the machine gets completely turned off. Now, we're gonna play with the BSR a little bit later, and that is the Bernina stitch regulator, which is the free motion foot. So when we attach the free motion foot, the BSR free motion foot, we do not have to select this. The machine, because it plugs into the machine, the machine's already gonna know that it's plugged in and it's gonna set itself. This would be more for other free motion feet, like ruler work feet, where we're not using a plugged in BSR um, or some other older free motion feet. So other, other feet besides the BSR, we do have to tell the machine that yes, we want to sew with our feet teeth turned off in a free motion capacity. The one below that, that looks like a bobbin, well, that is a bobbin. So if we touch this, that is going to play a video on how to load our bobbin case. This might be a little bit clearer than the video I just did for you, hopefully. Um, but the reason why they have it right there is because this is really important that we are doing this correctly. And if you had an older Bernina, you might only do the first step and not realize you have to do that second step, which is clicking into this wire here. And so it is so important that Bernina wanted to put it right on the, the screen as a reminder on how to get this done correctly. Okay, so that is all of the icons that are going down the left side. So now we're gonna talk about a few other icons. Okay, this is a good time to talk about the dials on the side of the machine and the needle position toggle on the front of the machine. So on, on the front, we have both our length dial, which is our bottom dial, so you can see as I'm turning this dial, our stitch length got longer or it got shorter. So, and this is a good, it's really nice that these machines now give us a representation on the screen of what is happening when we do certain stitch adjustments. So now, even though we're on a straight stitch, when I turn the width dial, it still activates a zigzag. Even though I'm not on my zigzag stitch, I am on my straight stitch because I am now giving it width. So it turns to a zigzag. So as I turn this, I can adjust my zigzag. And again, I can adjust the length there. So let's go back to normal here. Um, we also have our needle positions here. So if I needed to move my needle to the right or to the left, I can do that here. And, and there's a lot of reasons we need to reposition our needle sometimes. One real common one is if we're using a zipper foot for sewing on a zipper or if we're doing cording and we need that needle moved to the edge of that foot, we can do that really here, uh, right here with the use of these buttons. Another thing that I, I like too is that I can also um, reposition other stitches. So for instance, I'm on a zigzag now, I've changed the stitch. And I, if I need that zigzag then to zigzag to the edge of the foot, I can do that. I can move the zigzag around. It's not changing the width of the zigzag, it's just changing where the zigzag is going to be stitched out underneath the presser foot. Because it's nine millimeters, there's kind of a lot of room there for us to reposition our stitches around. So we can reposition, reposition any of the stitches that are on the machine. 
if we do not want to use these buttons or or these dials, sorry, they're not buttons, um, or if something has happened to our our little dials, this I got to tell you, if you are transporting the machine, this is the part of your machine to protect. These dials stick out of the front of the machine. So if something comes along and hits these dials really hard, they might actually break the dial. So we want to be cautious of this whenever we're transporting the machine. But let's say we did um, something happened and something really hit that that dial hard and that dial stopped working and we need to finish sewing before we bring it into our repair center to be fixed, which would be me. What we can do then is on the display, we can still adjust, do these adjustments by touching the width numbers that are displayed. And then we can use our toggle here to make our necessary adjustments. And if we want to go back to default, we can hit that button and it takes us back to default. Same thing with the length. If we hit the, the length number here, then we can adjust the length how we want it. And if we want to get it back to default, we can just hit the middle button and it takes us back to the default setting. So now we have our stitch menu here. So when you turn on the machine, the machine turns on to its utility menu. The utility menu is our kind of our common construction stitches. And then as we will go through these different menus here in just a moment. But if we want an expanded view of all of our stitches in this menu, you can see there's a little pop out button right there. So if we touch the pop out button. Now we get a bigger view. So then you can look around a little bit faster and find the stitch that you want to do. You can select the stitch and now we got the stitch on the screen and it, and it popped back in after we selected the stitch. Or we can just scroll through this way, view our menus. So now you'll notice there is a I button on the display. This button means there is more adjustments to the stitch hidden in there. That way they don't overly clog the screen with just too much. So they have it where you can activate this button and get to a few more adjustments. And now these adjustments, they are going to change depending on what function we're trying to do. So you'll notice some of this is grayed out because some of this has to do with doing buttonholes and some of it has to do with when we're programming things together. So we can we can ignore those because they don't pertain to the stitch we're doing, but we have these other adjustments like mirror image. So that is these two right here. What mirror image means is that the stitch, if you watch the stitch on the screen, when I touch the mirror image button, it flip flops. So this one flip flops the stitch this way. And then this one will flip flop it up and down. So one flip flops this way. The other one flip flops this way. Those are the mirror image buttons. We also have um, single stitch buttons. So if I touch that one and I say I only want five of these stitches, well, that's all it's going to do. It's going to do five of those stitches and it's going to stop for us. So that gives us our, um, let's go back here. Oh, let's hit the check mark and then we'll go back. There we go. Um, so that's, that is that one there. So, right. So that gives us our stitch control. Um, this one over here is a balance. So this one, we it's so rarely uh, that you ever have to touch this one. But it, if we're working on maybe a fabric that doesn't feed and track as well, and we're trying to do some decorative stitches and put little little hearts or little flowers on it, and those patterns look a little bit distorted, we can go into the balance and we can try to help correct the fact that the fabric maybe is not feeding as well or the, the balance on the machine's a little bit off. And this has to do with the feeding of the pattern. So if the pattern isn't fed and making the pattern the way that you that it's supposed to be on the display, we can do some adjustments. But again, very, very rare that we're going to ever touch that adjustment. And you don't have to worry about touching it because if you do touch it, you know, you can play around with things and you can very easily get back to the default just by hitting back to the default button. This next one is a density button. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe select a, a satin stitch in a little while and we, and we can play a little bit. It'll be a little bit easier to understand when we're on a different stitch. We can do the adjustments on this stitch, but it's not going to really 
mean much to you. So, um, so we're going to skip that for now. We're going to go to this one. That looks like three rows of stitches side by side. Um, what it, uh, this actually is, is a, a new feature that is, um, it's only on the, the plus editions. So if you have the regular 770, it's perfectly fine. You just don't have this little icon here. So what this icon is, is this icon is going to turn any single stitch to a triple, tripled over stitch on when you sew it on the fabric. So um, let me let me see if I can do a little demonstration here real quick and I'll just sew a little bit of these stitches. Oh, let me tell the machine that I have am set up a different way. So hold on one second. Okay, I just had to change my foot selection. Um, all right, so now we are going to sew just a little bit of this in its normal. And of course I only have five programs, so it's only gonna do five. So this is, um, I have the stitches normal, just single. So just one, one piece of thread. So now I'm going to hit the triple button. And so what looks like one stitch is actually three stitches. It has been tripled over. And you'll notice too, is as it's stitching, it's always gonna show you where the needle is on the stitch at any given time on the display. So you can see single, triple. So the, what's nice about this is it, sometimes when you're doing certain stitches, especially like decorative stitches, and maybe they are not popping out of your fabric, they're not bold enough. So then you can decide to triple them over, which would make them stand out more because now they're thicker, right? They're thicker and they're bolder. This one right here is our basting stitch function. Um, to do this, I think we're gonna go back to a regular straight stitch. Because this is going to, it's going to make the most sense when, when we're on a regular straight stitch. So I'm going to activate this basting feature and then I'm going to turn the camera so you can see it so. So then we're going to hit this button. I'm going to then move your, our camera view. Okay, so now you will see what what's going to happen is when it sews now, the needle is going to stop on every other stitch, even though the fabric is going to keep progressing. And that's what's going to allow it to do an extra long stitch length or a basting stitch. You can also use this feature, you know, playing around with other stitches so that it's going to spread out patterns or do other other kind of interesting things. But the more the more traditional when we select that button is going to be a basting feature. So you can see it's turning off the needle, see that? So it takes every other stitch, the needle actually goes down into the fabric. Let me show you this here. So you can see here, we have an extra long stitch length or baste. Okay, some of these other buttons we see across the bottom, bottom here. Um, this is going to be if we want to activate it into reverse. We'll notice that the stitching is now going backwards instead of forward from the presser foot on the display. That just means it's going to stay in reverse. So it's going to sew everything it sews, it's going to sew backwards. So that is turning on reverse to stay on until we turn it off. This is backstepping. So backstepping is something we're going to customize a little bit later for our reverse button just to automatically do. But that is where it goes back when it's reversing. It goes back into the exact holes that it stitched when it stitched forward. So it makes a really nice, clean backstitch appearance. The one that looks like a floppy disk, it's kind of might be a little outdated of an icon here. Um, but for us, it's been around for a while. This actually makes perfect sense. Uh, floppy disks are for saving information. So then if I was doing a stitch and maybe I had the stitch altered in certain ways and I had it all customized on the screen, well, I could just hit the little save or the floppy disk here, kink, and it would then save how that that stitch is set, how I wanted that stitch to be customized so that I don't have to go back and adjust it each time. And then when I'm done and I want it back to default, it's no problem. It is the one that looks like a floppy disk that has the line crossed out of it. So that is some of, of course, there's more to it. And we're going to get back into these, this menu a little bit later on. But um, that is some of the more basic settings that we see when we activate this I button. 
All right, so now we are gonna go down this row here, this column. So the top, right, that is our utility menu. That is what's automatically turned on to when we turn on the machine. That is where all of our normal straight stitch and zigzags are. Now, when we touch the icon right below that, that looks like a little squiggly satin stitch. That is gonna open up all of our decorative stitch menus. And so we also have a second menu here. And so in each of these menus, you notice they look like file folders because that is holding where all of those stitches are when we open up the file. So if we wanna open up this top one, we click that. Now we get to see all of the stitches that are in that top file. And of course, if we wanna see a bigger view, we can just expand it by hitting our expander. And when we see a stitch that we want to stitch out, we can just select the stitch and we see the stitch on the screen and we get to do it. Now, Bernina uses what's called breadcrumbs up here. So you notice that if I wanted to go one step back, instead of going here again, um, which I could do, I could also use my breadcrumbs and I can touch my breadcrumb here and it'll take me one step back. So just like on a computer does breadcrumbs, your sewing machine does also. So then again, if we wanted to see what was in this menu, we can hit this menu and then we got more stitches in that particular menu. This one's really cute. It's a little elephant. Let's go back one to our decorative stitch menus and we're gonna select a uh, satin stitch because I do want to show you, oops, I almost knocked over the camera. I wanna show you that um, we have a few other adjustments for satin stitches here in our I menu when we do our button here that we kind of skipped over. So this is our pattern um, elongator button. So we can start adjusting, doing some more adjustments to the length of this pattern or how long this pattern is going to um, is going to sew out. So we've got our stitch length buttons here and our stitch width buttons. So we can dial in our our length and our width here on our dials, or we could also we can also do it here. But then we can also start taking our pattern here and making it elongated. So we're not, we're even though we can adjust the length and the width here, we're not actually adjusting the length of the stitch. We are elongating the pattern of the stitch because we want this still to be a nice satin stitch. We just want this satin stitch to stitch a longer pattern. If I adjust my stitch length, which I was playing with when we first went into this menu, you can see how it starts to spread the stitches apart because that is adjusting the stitch length, which does affect the length of the pattern, but this is going to adjust the length of the pattern without actually affecting the stitch length that you had set. So it gives you more stitch control. So we can do a little bit more now than we could in years past. So we can take certain stitches, especially these satin stitches, and we can get the length and the width the way we want, and we can also elongate the pattern or stretch the pattern out. Okay, so let's go back now. So let's close this. We're gonna go back to our decorative stitch menu, and I'm gonna show you how we can now combine a few stitches together. So let's open up, I have not pre-selected some stitches, so let's just find some cute little stitches that seem to work pretty well together. And I'm gonna show you how we can combine those together. Because if we just select a stitch, we're just gonna get rows of the same stitches together, but that's not what we wanna do. So it's really simple to add stitches together. That is what this plus symbol is at the bottom of the row of stitches on the screen. So if I touch this plus, that is going to activate the feature of programming. So now let's say we want to do the rocket ship and you see a ro one single rocket ship on the, on the display with a star. So those kind of make sense to go together, a rocket ship on, and a star. And we can see it in this little view here. It shows us that we've put both of those on. So I'm going to then activate my machine to start sewing. And we're gonna sew this pattern out. And it's gonna sew it as a repeating pattern. So it's going to do it as a border. 
And this would look really cute on something for a little kid. And I'm gonna activate my pattern stop here so it stops at the end of that pattern. And now I, so I've got my rocket ship star, rocket ship star. And so any, any combination of stitches that you wanna put together, we can put together by hitting this plus here. So if I wanted to put the elephant and the turtle together or whatever, it doesn't matter. Any stitch in the machine, we can now start combining them together here. So now let's say you go, well, I, I don't want the rocket ship. Um, how do I delete that? Okay, fine. So we can select the rocket ship. We can hit our I button because that's where a lot of our stitch adjustments are outside of the normal basic adjustments. And I can hit the trash can. You see the trash can is now lit. The trash can was not lit before. So I can say, I want to trash can the one that I have highlighted. So that would then trash can it. If I want to trash can the next one, I can trash can the next one there. So let me close that menu and then let's pull up, uh, let's do a few other little combinations. So maybe I am going to do the, um, the tow truck with the other truck. And then for whatever reason, I'm going to put an elephant in there. I don't know why, just want to do it that way. So then um, I have them all up here. So if I go back into my little I button, I can um, either select this icon, which is going to select all of them to either be deleted or to be edited. I also want to point out that if you have the regular um, 770 QE, but not the plus, you won't get this little film strip here, but you can still do all, all of the same all of the same functions. Um, so again, this one is going to highlight highlight everything if you want to delete it. And then um, this one here actually is a little different. So this one we can add spaces. So you can do spaces between characters. This one would add a stop or this one would add um, a locking stitch. So then it would so, 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 and then it would, would lock there. Um, so lots of different ways that you can do um, some customizing in our programming screen there. And to turn off programming, so let's say we are done programming. So first, um, you do not have to delete everything out of your programming. Um, if you're going to just do that programming, sew it out, and then later on you're done sewing for the day. Because when I turn off the machine and turn it back on, that programming is going to be gone. Um, but but we're going to go back and do alphabets. So when we do alphabets, uh, we're going to use the programming feature also to do alphabets. So right now I went ahead and deleted everything, but you do not always have to delete everything because it'll the machine will do it when it turns on and off. But to turn off, so to turn off programming, because we're still in programming mode, you just hit the plus button again, and now we are out of programming mode and we're back into regular sewing mode. So we see the regular one row of patterns and we're not actually combining patterns together anymore. And just, just to recap, if we wanted to combine patterns again, you activate it by hitting here, we combine patterns together and we turn it off by hitting that same button and that takes us back to normal. So I'm going to delete everything that we have programmed. And if you did program something and you wrote it all out and you did want to save it, well, that's what the saving features are for. Um, we, we can then save those into the machine's memory and then we can recall them back uh, later on if we wanted to do that. So that is our... So that is our programming screen, and that was our decorative stitch menu. So we got our decorative stitch menus where all our fun stitches are and our programming screen. So now we're going to go down to our alphabets. So that is the next one on the list, and the machine has some pretty fantastic fonts built into it. And you can see we have a good amount in some other uh, language characters. I, I am kind of partial to the little outline one at the top, so we're going to select that. And you can see that it opens up into our stitches. So now, if I start hitting letters, you can see I just get one letter on the screen, and that is not what I want. I want to actually write a name. So to write a name, we have to then go into our programming mode, just like we did before. So if I hit my plus, that is going to turn on programming mode. And if I want to write my name, so my name is John. So let's write John. 
So I can see that I've written my name. If I happen to have made a mistake, I can then highlight the character that was wrong. I can go in, I can delete it, and I can put in the correct character if I need to. But in this case, it looks like all of my characters are written just fine. Um, let's say I wanted to do my name and add that fun little uh, rocket ship that we did. Well, that is no problem. I could just go back in and I can go to my, um, my decorative stitches and I can grab the little rocket ship and I can put it in there. No problem. But I don't actually want to do that. So I just want to have my, my name on there. So then when we are writing the name and we get it done, we can go back in and we can decide if we want to add a stop at the end of the name. So if we added a stop at the end of the name, we can do that here by adding a stop or we can add a not. So then it's just gonna do the name and it's gonna stop. So when we're ready to sew out this name, we can just simply hit our foot control and it is going to start sewing. see there's a little stop on the button because on the stop sign appeared on the screen because we told it we only wanted to do the one name and stop and there is my name john yep so quick little recap the programming is also used when you are writing a name so when you go to the fonts and you pick the font that you want to do you have to activate the programming in order to write a font. Otherwise, you just get a single character. So then you activate the, the programming and then you can write the name that you want to write. And when we're done, we just hit that button and now we're back to normal. So that is our alphabets. Yeah, really fun. So we are going to skip over the buttonholes because we're going to double back to buttonholes. So we are going to go into our quilting menu, which is this one right here. Quilting menu is great. This is where all of our quilting stitches are. They compiled, compiled it into one menu for us to make it really, really easy for us to find it. So a lot of quilters who turn on their Bernina, they go right to this menu because these are the stitches that they want to stitch out. So now when you're in the quilting menu, one thing I like to point out is we have straight stitches in our quilting menu. They are different than the straight stitches that we see when we're in our utility menu. One thing that you might notice is in our utility menu, the tension here is much higher, it's 5.25. When I go to my quilting menu and I select my quilting stitch, my tension is 4.0. So the tensions get slightly adjusted for to better accommodate the quilter. Also, this stitch here starts different than your regular straight stitch. Quilters do not like to typically do a big lock stitch on their piecing work because it's bulky and it doesn't work out well for them. So Bernina has overcome this obstacle by doing really close together stitches at the very beginning and then it sews off like normal so that you do still have that security of having your uh, some form of a lock on your fabric without having to worry about the bulkiness that you get out of that. So I'm going to select this. I'm going to turn the camera and um, if you kind of watch, you will be able to see that it's going to do some close together stitching before it sews off like normal. So close together, close together, and now it's sewing like normal. All right, so that is our quilting menu. And of course you have uh, pages of stitches in the quilting menu. So now we have our heart menu. So our heart menu is where we are going to save combinations of stitches together. So if you did program a name, uh, so let's say I wrote my name, John, and I put the little rocket ship next to it. And I wanted to save that into the machine uh, to be recalled later on. 
I can do that. Let's let's actually um, do that together real quick, just so that you have a good visual on how this is done. But we are going to always save combinations using our heart menu here. So we are going to go back up here. I'm going to activate programming mode, and we're just going to quickly delete everything that I have put into programming mode so that we are completely gone there. And let's go ahead and select the font that I like. I am going to write my name, John. And then let's go ahead and um, find maybe that little rocket ship. So I'm going to put the rocket ship with it. So I got John with the rocket ship there. All right. And I don't want this to be a border. I just want it to be my name and stop. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to hit that I want it to stop after it does my name. So now I have everything written out and it is done. I don't want to ever have to do this again. I just want to do it one time. So what I can do is I can then go to my heart right here. All right, then I'm going to save it into the one that looks like the arrow going into the file folder. That means we're taking what's on the screen and we're saving it into the file folder. So we are going to select the file folder. We can see what we are saving. I'm going to hit the check mark. Now that has been saved into the machine. So if we are, let's say we're getting back to the machine and we're turning off programming and we're doing other stitches and we've come back to the machine maybe a month later and we want to recall what we had been um, stitching before or what we had programmed and saved. So we're going to go into our heart menu. We're gonna activate our programming because Again, we're going to put it back into programming, um, but let me actually, let's do this. Let's delete everything that is in my programming screen because until I turn the machine on and off, it's still going to be there. So I, I want you to see that it, that we're actually going to recall it and it's just not still there. So so again, so we're coming back to it. Let's say we're, we're in other stitches and so we're going to go back to it. We're going to go to our heart menu. We're going to went, pull from the file folder that has the three dots, meaning that we were programming combinations of stitches together. But one thing I wanna point out is if I'm not in program mode and I go to my heart menu, I do not have the programming saved folder because that folder can only be activated when we are in programming mode. So we are going to make sure we are in programming mode and then you get that program folder. Otherwise that folder will not be there. See how the folder's not there? And now it's there. Okay, so I just wanted to take you on a little side journey because it's important to know that. So if we're going to recall something that we have programmed, we're going to click the file folder with the arrow coming out of it. And then we can see there is my name there with the little rocket ship. And now we can stitch that out again. So if you made like a quilt label and you wrote made with love, um, and you do this a lot and you, you know, are made by so-and-so, um, you can make that label and make it as cute as you want. You can save it into your heart menu. And then we're able to recall that later on just by making sure we're in program mode and then go to your heart menu and pull out of that file folder. And then if we did put something into our file folder that we just simply don't want anymore, we wanna delete that, then what we can do is we can go to our trash can and our list will be here of everything that we've saved. We can select the one we want to get rid of and we just trash can it. And now that is gone until we put something else in there. Yeah. And then the other one here is going to be for sewing stitches. So if we were customizing our sewing stitches and we moved it a few clicks over and a few clicks there and we did all kinds of little tweaks to our stitch. If we go into our heart menu, and we save into this folder, then we can save into our heart menu. Actually, we were recalling, sorry. We had to put it into our heart menu, so that's into the file folder. It's gonna ask us where we wanna save it. We wanna save it into that one. We're gonna hit the check mark. And so then later on, we're coming back to this and we're on different stitches and it's a, you know a year later and we wanna recall that um, stitch. We go to our heart menu. We go to the one that comes out of the file folder and there is our stitch to recall and now it's back and and, and again we want to delete that if we're done and we don't want that to be saved again or ever into our file folder we can just delete it that way um so so i want to talk though really quick because i had mentioned a different save earlier so there's two different saves 
So this one is saving the stitch into a special folder. It's gonna save any changes you made to this stitch, or if you didn't even make any changes and you just wanna put all your stitches in one spot that you use a lot, then you can use your heart. The one that if we are up here and we touch this one, that is gonna change the stitch to how the machine turns onto that stitch. So anytime that I alter this stitch and I save that in this spot, that means every time I go to that stitch, it's going to go to the stitch with the settings that I've pre-selected. So different saves. They're not, they're not the same thing. So one is we're changing the, the stitch as its default, and the other one is we're just saving a stitch into, into a folder. So that is our heart folder. All right, and this next one down that looks like um, multiple pieces of paper, that's what it looks like to me. Um, what this is, is this is your history. And I kind of like this because a lot of times when people are sewing, they sew with the same group of stitches all the time. So if I go to this icon, this is gonna bring up, you can see, you know, we've, this is some of the stitches we've been playing with, right? So it's remembering our history of stitches and so then you can quickly just jump between the stitches that you've been recently um, recently using in your in your sewing. So this is our, our memory. All right, so now we are gonna go back up to the button that we, we skipped earlier, which is our buttonholes. This machine does fantastic buttonholes. So we want to make sure that we know how to do these and it's, it's very simple. So we're going to select our buttonhole selector there and we're going to see that we have menus of buttonhole stitches on the screen and for what we're doing today we are just going to pick the first one the really common buttonhole there and when we look on the screen we can see that it's showing us using our buttonhole foot it is also flashing the reverse at us so there's two different ways that we can go about doing our buttonholes and this kind of goes back to the original way that Bernina would do this is you would sew the first buttonhole more manually so that you told the machine how when to switch directions to make the buttonhole the length you want it. And then the machine would then remember that first buttonhole that you sewed and it'll repeat it over and over and over again. Um, but that's not typically the way that I do it. But that is why the reverse symbol is flashing. Now, there is a much nicer way to do our buttonholes, and that is to select our little I button here. And you can see here, we have a 16 length of a button hole right now. So if I select that one where it says 16, now what I can do is I can take then the button that I'm going to sew, and I can match it to the yellow circle on the screen. So as I turn my dial here, you'll see that circle grow or shrink depending on which way I'm turning my dial. So if I take my button and I hold my button onto my screen and I bring that yellow circle to be the size of the button that I'm holding on my screen, now, the machine is going to automatically do a buttonhole that is the right size for that button. Isn't that fantastic? What a cool feature. I really like this. So I am going to then, uh, we're gonna change the camera view and we're gonna sew out this buttonhole. Okay, so we need to, of course, attach our buttonhole foot. So there is a little release lever for our presser feet. We just lift that lever away the foot pops off we can take our buttonhole foot and we can attach it by bringing the lever back down it is going to grab onto that foot now we have sewn on this fabric a lot so i am going to find a little clear spot on it that we can do our buttonhole eh, probably about there will work all right so we've pre-selected our size right we held our button to the screen it knows what size our buttonhole is going to be so I just have to start. Let's 
See that? What a great buttonhole. It's perfect and it is perfect for the size of button that I am sewing so that I don't have to worry that it's not the right size. So um, holding to the screen works really well. And then what's gonna happen is that buttonhole is just gonna repeat over and over and over again. It'll do the same one until we tell it to do something different, which is fantastic. Because usually when we do one buttonhole, we usually have to do five buttonholes. So this is a really, really nice way to get your buttonholes done absolutely perfect. See that? And then, of course, um, as you would imagine, I, I recommend, and everybody does, that you do a test buttonhole always before you jump right onto your garment because you want to make sure that your button is perfectly matched for your buttonhole. And it's really easy to open buttonholes. I don't have my seam ripper on, on hand, but so if you want to play it safe, take a little push pin and put it right across the top here so that you don't accidentally cut the bar tack. Take your seam ripper at the bottom and just rip up the middle until you hit the, the little pin you put in there and your buttonhole is open. All right, so now we are gonna go through some of these side icons here so we get an understanding of what all of these are. So now this top home button will take us to the opening screen where we can select either sewing and or embroidery. So now I don't have an embroidery unit with my machine because I just wanted to have it to be a really nice sewing machine. But the thing that I really love about Bernina is that all of these machines are embroidery capable, meaning that if you buy it as a sewing machine and in two years you decide, well, you know what? It would be really nice if I had that embroidery arm because I can do some really cute, cute things or make some really great quilt labels or something just changed in your life where you want to be a little bit more Go a little bit more with your machine. So then you can just get the unit and you can add it to the machine because your machine has the full capabilities to be an embroidery machine. So when I hit the home button, it can ask us which direction do we want to go in with the machine. So we are want to sew. So we're back into the sewing mode. Let me close. Let's, let's just get out of the buttonhole real quick. Okay, so now we have the next one down was is the gears. Um, this is where we're going to do some of the customizing of our machines, but we're going to skip that for now and we're going to go to the instruction book. So when I touch the instruction book, this is going to open up some very um, quick instruction for your machine. I mean quick, meaning these are the more commonly asked questions. They have them com compiled into this one section on the machine. Um, on the machine, when we have the, the one that says threading, what we are going to notice is we are going to get all of our threading questions answered. So if we had questions about winding the bobbin, we can click wind the bobbin. And guess what? The machine plays us a really great video showing us exactly how to wind the bobbin. go back there. If we needed questions about sewing techniques, we can get there. Embroidery techniques. We have questions about needles. This is where our questions get answered. So that is all in our instruction book button that is on the machine. Okay, so now we're going to go to the dress form. When we hit the dress form button, So what this does, this is a great feature to the machine and it opens up this program that helps you to be on the right page when you're working on different kinds of fabric. This especially works well with garment construction because in garment construction we do lots of fabrics and different kinds of techniques. So there's kind of two parts to this. So uh, the first thing that you do is you select the kind of fabric that you are going to work on. Now, if you look at these, all of these represent different fabric types. If we do not know what the fabric is, then what we can actually use is this help button right here. So right underneath the dress form is a little question mark. So if we touch the question mark button and we touch anything that we see on the screen, it is going to tell us exactly what that icon is. So when we use a question mark and we touch that the particular icon that we touched is for heavyweight knit. And it gives some examples of what is a heavyweight 
net. So if we hit the question mark again, and we hit maybe this one over here, this is gonna tell us that this is light woven fabric. And again, gives us some ideas of what is a light woven fabric. So then what we can do then is we can pick the fabric that we're working on. So let's say we are gonna work on um, a kind of a knit that's a little bit heavier. So we're gonna select that one for the heavyweight knits. So then it opens up to this page. This page asks us what technique we want to do on the kind of fabric that we selected. So some of these might be a little obvious when you look at it. You know, that is installing a zipper. This is doing um, a buttonhole stitch. Oh, I deleted it away. So let's get back to where I was. Um, this is setting a, a seam. This is seam and overcast. And if you're unsure again, what we would do is we would hit the question mark and we would touch the icon and it would tell us this is for doing a blind hem. So then we can say, okay, we want to do a seam and overcast. So we're gonna select this function right here. And then this tells us a few things over here. It tells us what stitch it's gonna pick for us. It's gonna pick stitch 20. It tells us the proper needle to work with, the proper thread we should be sewing with, and the proper foot that we should be working with. If we need more information about the foot, we can hit the button there on the foot and it's gonna give us some more information. But when, we, when we've selected our fabric and we've selected our technique, then we can hit our check mark and the machine then is going to set itself up for doing this technique. So what it has done is it has selected the 12 C foot as a foot we should be working with. It has preset the foot pressure to be a different foot pressure setting as it would be when we're doing normal sewing. It has also selected the stitch for us. So it has completely set the machine up for doing this technique that we chose on the fabric that we chose. So all of that happens here in the dress form part of the machine. So I really, really appreciate that the machine has this information for us because it's going to guide us and keep us on the right page when we need that kind of information. So the dress form is very, very handy. So the one before, below that, we talked about that a little bit already, but we can talk about how this works in the entire screen, and that is the question mark button. So when we're looking at our, our screen here, we have lots of different icons, and if we need to know what any icon is for. So let's say we open up the eye and we see these icons and we forget what they're for. So what we can do is we can hit the question mark and then we can hit one of those icons and it's gonna tell us exactly what that icon is used for. We can also hit the question mark and we can touch a stitch and it's gonna tell us what that stitch is and what it's used for. So anything on the screen, Anything over here, it's going to tell us there's anything that you see, that question mark is going to answer the question that you have about what that icon is for. This is fantastic. Really great because it really can guide us uh, through the machine and answer those questions so we don't have to take out our book and kind of figure out what is this strange looking icon or I knew there was an icon that did something but I forgot which icon it was. So that question mark is absolutely fantastic for that. Underneath the question mark, we have Eco. Eco is a nice feature also. Um, when you get a Bernina uh, or a lot of modern sewing machines, you will notice that when you turn them on, they take a little while to boot up because they're, these are very sophisticated machines. And so it is a lot like restarting your cell phone or restarting your tablet or your computer. When you are restarting your cell phone, it doesn't immediately turn back on. It takes a little while for it to boot up, right? So you're kind of waiting that 30 seconds or longer. So when we turn off the machine and turn it back on, then we have a little waiting period for it to turn on while everything kind of reboots. So instead of doing that, there is times where we could just decide to hit eco. And the eco is, you can see kind of me filming, eco is gonna put the machine to sleep here. So the machine is now to sleep, all the lights are off, we can go to bed, we can go about our business, leave the house. And when we're ready to pick back up, we hit eco again, it's gonna wake the machine back up and it's going to then continue from that wherever we, we left off. 
So there is also a difference too, because if we turn off our machine and go to bed, then when we turn it back on, it's going to turn back on to its startup stitch, which is a straight stitch. If we are sewing and it's getting late and we have to go to bed, and this was the last setup we were doing, well, you can just hit eco instead, go to bed, come back the next morning, hit eco, and the machine is still set exactly how it was set last night when you were sewing. So eco, um, I like eco because there's lots of times when I'm going to use it. If I'm not going to be using, then I'm going to use it. If I'm not going to be using the machine for a long period of time, of course, I'm going to power off the machine. But if I'm just taking a break, uh, going to bed and I know I'm going to pick up sewing again in the morning, um, Eco is a great alternative to that. And then um, this button stands for clear. There are certain um, functions we might do uh, where we would clear. Um, so let's let's go back now and we are going to go to the gears because this is where we can really customize some of the settings in the sewing machine. So we're going to go into this gear here. And now we have a few different things going on. So um, the first one we're going to visit, um, we are going to visit that one. Well, let's skip that one for now. We're gonna we're gonna double back because there's a certain order that I like to go in things and, and explain so that we can play around a little bit in some of these menus. And that's the one we're gonna play around with, I think, last. So the one that has to do with the embroidery hoop. Well, I, I told you earlier that this machine is embroidery capable. So all of our embroidery adjustments we could find in this screen if we did, did need to make adjustments to the embroidery. The one that looks like a person, if we touch this, this is gonna open up some of our customizing. We might prefer different colors for our screen, different motifs. And when we turn on the machine, we can have a welcome message. If we want to write a special message, we can go, you know, good morning, John, um, or whatever we wanna write on in the message so that when we turn on the machine, it will display that message as it is booting up. So we're gonna use our little breadcrumbs to go back one step. So that is what was in the one that looks like a little person. The one that looks like an eyeball. This is the machine has sensors that uh, is monitoring the top thread and the bobbin thread as the machine is sewing. So if we turn off the monitoring, it is no longer gonna know if our thread is broke. It's no longer gonna know if, if we even have thread in the machine. So then and there's not very many times that you, you actually wanna do this. Me as, as a sewing machine technician, there is times that I am going to turn both of these off so that I can run the machine with no thread in it and maybe listen for a noise that only comes on after five minutes of running or, or different reasons. So, uh, so I, I do use this feature from time to time, but I can't think of many practical reasons why you would actually use these features because as a safety precaution, we really want both of these turned on so that if your thread breaks, the machine is going to stop knowing that your thread breaks or if it runs out, it knows there's an issue or if your bobbin thread runs out, it's going to then prompt you that it runs out. So, but that's what these settings do. They turn off the machine from watching those, those parts of the machine. The one that looks like a speaker, this, as we are touching the screen, you're going to notice that the machine has been making little, little beep, beep, beep as I'm touching different icons. If I do not like the beeps, I can turn all the beeps off here so then it, the icons still touch but they just don't do don't make the beep so then or i can decide i want other sounds so you can hear some of the other sounds are maybe uh to me they're a little bit more annoying uh, i like i like the defaults and i think that's probably why it is the default it's the most pleasing to most people but if you need something to be a little bit more uh, more aggressive in the tone, uh, maybe your hearing's not good, you can switch to one of those other tones. The, you'll notice this one down here. So that right there represents the Bernina stitch regulator. It is actually a picture of that attachment for the machine, which we're going to get to in just a minute. And so that attachment, when you're using the Bernina stitch regulator, if you are not moving your fabric very well or too quickly, the machine can make a chime or a noise at you to let you know that you need to maybe correct the way you're moving the fabric. So when I activate that, then I get that noise to tell me I have to make some adjustments to how I'm, I'm running with the BSR. When somebody is new with free motion or new with the BSR, a lot of times I will have them turn on the noise, but the noise is off by, um, by default. 
Okay, so that is that is your sounds there. We're gonna get over into the sewing machine here and we're gonna do a few different things. Um, the world is going to be where we can select the language that we speak so that everything will pop up in that language. The light bulb here is so that we can adjust the lighting on the machine. So at night, the lighting might be a little bit too bright for you at night. So you have the option then to turn the lighting down or you can turn the lighting completely off. This one on top is your display. So if your display is too bright for night, you can dim it or you can bring it to max. I find the display not overwhelming in the evening, so I tend to leave that at the highest setting. So those are your light settings for the machine. This one that is the screen. So what we are gonna do here is I wanna talk a little bit about the screen. I'm gonna find my little, my little pointer, which I think I must have set down somewhere. Um, so let me pause the camera for a second and find that. All right, I found my pointer. So what I'm going to tell you about this one. Um, this one can trip up a lot of people. What this is, is it's the screen calibration setting. So the thing to know is as soon as we enter the screen calibration settings, it has erased all the calibration settings for the touch panel the second we touch this icon. And so when you do go into this icon, we actually have to do the calibration. What, uh, what people sometimes do is they're just fooling around in their machine, which is perfectly fine, I want them to. They touch this icon and it takes them into a screen that they don't recognize. It is a gray screen with a little cross on it. And they, they kind of panic a little bit. And so they end up turning off the machine and turning it back on to reboot to get out of where they were. Because there's no X, you can't, you can't just, just close that screen. When they do that, the machine turns back on perfectly normal but everything looks fine, but the touch panel doesn't work. You're touching the panel and nothing is acknowledging. It's because this, the panel no longer has the information it needs because it's no longer calibrated. And that is because they entered calibration and then they panicked and turned the machine off. So if you do enter this mode, which we're gonna do, because I, I just want you to see how this is done in case you do enter this mode. It is very, very simple to recalibrate the screen. Me personally, if I was to ask Bernino one, one thing, I would say when you enter here, let there be a second prompt to ask the person if they wanna recalibrate the screen um, so that they do not get into this, I accidentally went here and now my machine doesn't work and I have to call my dealer to figure out how we're gonna correct this problem. And it's really easy if you do enter here and you panic and you turn off the machine and now your screen calibration settings don't work and you can't use the touch panel, there is a really easy backdoor fix for it. You could Google it. There's a bunch of people pop up and Google tell you what to do. You can call your tech, call me. Um, really easy, takes seconds to, to correct the problem, but you have to know what to do when that happens. Okay, to make a long story short, if you do go in here, you're gonna do the calibration. So we are gonna go in here now. So we went in here and you see the screen change drastically. There's no way to get out of this now without calibrating it. So you're gonna see there's a little cross here in this corner. We're gonna take our little pointer and we're gonna to touch right in the middle of that cross. Now the cross moved. It is over here now. We're gonna take our pointer. We're gonna to touch right in the middle of this one. Now it moved again. We're gonna take our pointer. We're gonna to touch right in the middle of that one. And now we are back. We have just reset our touch panel. So it's easy if you do get in there, just if you do get in there, just 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 do it. Or don't ever go in there unless it has unless you feel like you have to recalibrate your screen. So that's all. So either go in there or don't. But if you do go in there, make sure you do it. All right, this one down here that looks like a factory. This is supposed to represent Bernina's factory that they used to use in Switzerland. Um, I think they need to update this picture because it looks a little polluty to me out of that smokestack, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Um, this would be where we would go if we wanted to re do some factory resets with some of the settings on our machine. And of course we do not want to do that. So we're going to leave that mode. We're going to skip this one for a second. We're going to go to the eye. The eye is going to be information about our sewing machine. So when we touch the eye, we can find out what our version number on the machine is. So this machine has a software version of 390711. This is a cur current model, uh, it just came out of the box. So I believe that is the most current model version. Um, 
But if we do, if we are a person who is not afraid to update your software at home on your sewing machine, great, do it. It's not hard. Um, what happens is you visit Bernina's website for your machine and you go to the support pa page. It'll tell you what the current version is. And if there is a version number that's higher than what's in the machine, you download it onto a flash drive. You put the flash drive into the machine and we update it. Uh, the, it's, there's step-by-step -step instructions. It's actually pretty easy to do. But if you did need to see what version number you are currently running, that's where you would find out. That's the version number. Um, some of the other things that aren't important, really important for you to know, but how much flash memory you have in the machine. This is where your serial number is in your machine, but your serial number is also printed on a sticker that is on the machine. So both, both spots. Total number of stitches, 8,829 stitches. Um, this machine just came out of the box at the start of filming this video, and I have not sewn 8,829 stitches. Uh, everything that we've sewn today, uh, I would say, is, is less than 1,000 stitches, but, but that's because they test these machines in the factory. So the factory is sewing these off before they let them go to, to anybody. So we always have some stitches on the machine, even though it just came out of the box. Um, total number of stitches since last maintenance. So you'll see that number is very similar to that number. Um, and so as soon as you have your machine maintained by a dealer, this is professionally maintained, not you dusting out your machine. Um, this is you doing your annual with, with, your, with your dealer. They go back into the service mode and they reset that number. So they know how long it's been since you've done a maintenance on your machine. And total number of cut cycles since you cleaned your cutter. That is something we're going to get into in a little bit when I told you about the maintenance section. The maintenance section is part of the maintenance is cleaning your cutter. And this is something you do uh, at home on a regular basis. And this will tell this kind of this kind of um, is a tattletale, tattletale feature, <laughs> if I can say that, because uh, it tells on you if you're not doing it. So me as a, a service tech, if I get somebody whose cutter isn't functioning very well, and I go and I click on here and I see that this says it's been, you know, 650 cuts since it's been cleaned. I know they're not cleaning their cutter and that's probably why their cutter's not working anymore. So basically what this means is I have, since we've taken it out of the box and been running the machine, I have hit that cutter button 15 times. And as soon as we, as soon as we do the cutter cleaning, and we're going to do that, uh, that number is going to go back to zero, and then it's going to start counting again. So anyway, that's all the information we see on this screen, which is this one. This one is just simply a phone book. If you want to put in Bernina's phone number, um, if you want to put in your local dealer, you know me in your in your phone book, uh, so you have a quick know know where to find our phone numbers if you need to call us. Um, log is going to be if we are exporting information from the machine. Uh, as service, more service related stuff. So we would do that there. Okay, so that is what we found in the I button. Now we are gonna go to this one and we are gonna, we're gonna go to this one, but then we're gonna come back to this one a little while in the maintenance section. The first one is if we have to calibrate the um, buttonhole foot, if it doesn't seem to be um, reading uh, well or, or functioning right, we can go in here and do a calibration. This is where if we did download the software update from the website and we wanted to install our update, this is where we would go to install the update. This is has all to do with embroidery, so we don't have to worry about that, but it's um, some embroidery calibrations. This one is the one we're going to come back to because this is actually your cutter cleaning right here. This is the one you're going to do often when you're cleaning your thread cutter. That makes that other number go back to zero. And this one is oiling your machine. So we're going to go back to this too, but this is going to give you some videos on how to do some of your maintenance. So we're going to talk about a few different ways that we are going to do our maintenance on the machine. But the nice thing is we do have some videos um, built into the machine. Whoops, I didn't mean to go all the way out of there. Um, some videos built into the machine that will tell us how to do, do some of our maintenance here. So maintenance, maintenance. All right, let's go all the way back out here. Now we get to do some fun customizing on our machines. So we are going to go into our stitch. So let me go one back so you can see we're going into this one, which is the straight stitch and zigzag. And the first one we're gonna come to is our thread tension. Now, if you remember earlier in the video, we were able to adjust our thread tension on our screen. And I told you over and over and over again, you don't have to worry about that adjusting it because the machine's not gonna remember 
you're going to turn off the machine, turn it back on, it's going to reset. This one, because this is in our tools setting for the machine, this one is going to remember. So let's say, let's click on it. And let's pretend that you have this, your machine, and you notice on your machine, everything so is okay, but you see a little bit of, of the bobbin thread on the top. And that is consistent across the board. You always see it. Or the vice versa is true. You always get a little bit too much on the underside. And we're, we're talking minor, right? Um, so then you can go, okay, I know my machine across the board is just a little one way or a little bit uh, the other way. And I don't want to bring it to my dealer just yet. I want to keep sewing and I don't want to have to keep adjusting or, or deal with, with how it is. So what you can do is they give you the ability to fine tune a little bit. So I can change my default tension here. So I brought it down. When I bring it down numbers, it means I'm going to see more of that top thread on the underside of the fabric. Or if I went the other way, it's I'm going to have be pulling the bobbin thread up higher to the top of the fabric. So however I feel like I need to adjust it, I can adjust that. And now when I turn on the machine each time, every stitch is adjusted slightly higher on the tension. So we are doing this across the board, across our entire machine. So you can do this because it's easy enough to put back to normal if you want to just come back into your tools and click it back to normal just to make sure you didn't adjust anything that maybe you you went too far or whatever. Um, but you can play around with this too. That's why they give it to you. It's your machine, you can customize it. So, all right, so that is our tension settings. The next one over here is gonna be our speed. So the machine will sew fairly fast. And if you are a person who does not like to sew very fast ever, you can decide to turn your speeds down. Now, honestly, I don't know a lot of people who turn their speeds down because we also have a speed slider on the front of the machine that we can adjust down if we don't want our machine to run as fast. And then in certain times we do want it to go quicker then we didn't have changed the, the overall setting, but you can. So this is how you would adjust it. And again, you wanna go back to normal, just hit that button and it takes you back to normal. So that is your overall speeds for your entire machine. All right, this is your lock stitch feature. So every time, so right now this is on, and this would be off. So when it's on, when we're at the beginning of a stitch, the machine is going to automatically do a lock stitch before it sews off every time by default. So this means every, you want the machine every time to do a lock stitch for you automatically. That, that way you don't have to hit the reverse button or you don't have to hit any other buttons. It is just simply going to do that for you. Now, there's some people who say, I do not want it to do that. I only want it to do a lock stitch when I tell it to do a lock stitch. So it really depends on the kind of sewing you do. That's why these machines are customizable. So for some people, they want it off, and then other people, they want it on. So this machine happened to come with it on by out of the box, so on from the factory. All right, so that's what that one. We're going to save this one for last. We're going to go down to the foot control. The foot control is quite great. We are going to go in here and we're going to talk about a few things. And I'm going to, uh, we're going to change the camera angles a few times so you can see a few different things. So if you've been with Bernina for a while, then you will know that there is a kickback feature on the foot control. So when you run a foot control, you need, you push the foot control down and the machine will, will sew. But when you heel back, or you use the ball of your foot on, on the very tip of the foot control, then um, you push it the opposite direction and it activates a function. So on, on Bernina's in the past, that function would always be to put the needle down or the needle up. It was a needle up down function. But in these more modern machines now, we can customize them to be a bunch of different functions. So right now, we are gonna leave it at its default, which is needle up down, and I'm going to change the camera view because I want you to see it um, sewing on a, on a piece of fabric just so you get a really good idea of what's happening. And then we're going to change some settings so you can see how the settings can change. OK, so now I'm going to start sewing. Now, if I heel back on my foot control, meaning I'm pushing backwards on the foot control with my heel, see how it activated needle down? 
And so now if I start sewing again and I stop, it's back up and I heel down, it's back down. If I hit the heel again, it puts the needle up. If I hit the needle, the heel again, it puts the needle down. So that is how I have my foot control programmed right now. So let's go back in and we're gonna change some of the programming so that you can see some other things we can do. Okay, so now we can customize. So we can take away that feature by hitting the little heart. So the little heart's gonna give us some more options that we can do when we push back on our foot control. These are both different types of locking features. So that is a knot lock. This is a, a lock where it's kind of side by side in a little like cross. And then this one is little stitches kind of close together as if you were in your quilting menu. And this is how many of those little close together stitches you are gonna get as your locking feature. So we have a few different um, a few different ways that we can um, do this. We also have it where it can um, cut and raise the foot. So we can do all of these together or we can do them separate. So we can say, every time I heel back, I only want it to raise the presser foot up and down. Or every time I heel back, I don't want it to not, I just want it to cut and raise the presser foot or I want it to cut without raising the presser foot. But I kind of like to do all of those features so that when I heel back, it's going to lock my stitch, it's gonna cut, and it's gonna raise my presser foot. And this saves me from having to hit multiple buttons to get these commands to happen. So I'm gonna change the camera angle that you can see how this happens now when I sew. All right, so now we're gonna start sewing. When I get to the end of my seam, I'm gonna heel back on my foot control. Now the machine is locking, cutting, and raising the presser foot. So all of that happened just by me heeling back on the foot control, and it was done because that is how I customized my foot control to function. All right, so let's go back into our tools, and we are going to go back, and we're gonna turn off those settings because I want them to be back to, to my needle up down setting. So I just wanted to be back to how it was at the, at the factory. Even though if this was my personal machine, I probably would have some other commands um, programmed in there because I kind of like those other ones. But for now, we're just gonna put it back to normal. So let's go one back. Now we get to play with some of our buttons. This is where we get to customize our buttons. Let me go one step back because I kind of went there quickly. So we are right into that one. That looks like a finger hitting buttons. That is where we're gonna customize our buttons. So now let's start with our presser foot up and down button. So when we hit our presser foot up and down button, this is um, where we can customize how it, it, how far it goes up and down. So you'll notice I had a customer the other day, she didn't realize that the green button that was on the front of the machine would lower the presser foot all the way against the fabric. So it was annoying her that the presser foot kept jumping up a little bit. So what she did is she was clever enough to come in and, and lower you know, this button all the way down to zero which made it so that when she hit the presser foot up and down button, it no longer jogged up. It always stayed against the fabric. Well, I, I taught her the proper way to do it, and now she has it set back to normal. But this, this would be the adjustment for that. How high does a foot jog up? So that is the first one there. So we're going to go back one. The scissor button here is one that... A lot of people uh, customize this, but it really depends on the kind of sewing you do. So um, a lot of the machines I get across my workbench have been customized, but not all of them. So, so right now, when I hit the cutter button, when I'm sewing, it just cuts immediately. But if I want it to lock for us first, I can activate our lock, and now I have my different locking options that I can play with on how I want it to lock. So now what would happen is, well, actually, let's sew this out so you can see what would happen uh, instead of just, just me talking about it. So let me go over now. Let's go out of this menu, and I will reposition the camera so that you can see what happens. So now... I am going to sew and then I'm gonna now hit the cutter and it is now locking before I cut. It all happens very quickly, but you might've noticed that 
the fabric stopped moving, it started to do um, small stitches to lock the stitch before it cut each time. So if you do want every time you hit the cutter for it to lock, 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 then that is how we activate it. Because again, this is our machine to customize exactly how we want it to be customized. All right, let's get our view back to our screen here. So let's get back into here. So that is our cutter. So again, we can customize it. And again, we can customize how many stitches we get, how it locks, all of those things can be customized. But right now we're gonna put it back to normal. So I turned it back off. When I say normal, I just mean how it came from the factory, not necessarily normal because there is no normal. Um, all right, so now I'll reverse over here. Uh, this is one that I love to customize for people. Uh, this is our reverse. This is backstepping. Backstepping is my preferred way to reverse. So let me, let's actually, we'll, we'll sew this so that you can see how when it goes back, it goes back into the exact holes that it did forward when it backstepping is turned on. So let me again change my camera view. All right, so I'm gonna sew forward. I'm gonna hit my reverse to sew back and then it's gonna sew back forward. And then I'm gonna hit my reverse. All right, so. I don't know if you can, how well you can see that, but it's back in the same holes. So it, see how it looks like individual thick stitches? That's because we have backstepping turned on. Otherwise, it would still reverse, but it may not hit those same holes. So I like this because I think it looks a lot cleaner when I backstitch. All right, so let's get our view back over this one. And this setting, I am, I think I'm just gonna leave that on even though I, I usually put things back to the factory, but um, okay, so we're back in here. So that is the reverse, right? So I like it to be, to be done that way. All right, so now we're going to start at this bottom here, which is our locking stitch. So we have a button on the front of the machine right here, you know, on the little diagram, one of our physical buttons that we played with earlier. Whoops, hit the camera. Um, so this is uh, how our machine does its lock stitch. So we can decide that we want it to do it in a different fashion. We want more, bigger locks, all of those things. So you can customize how the machine does its lock stitch when it is locking for us. This one is one I absolutely um, will customize on my personal machine. So let me go back one here. So this is our needle up down function. So when we stop with the needle in the fabric, do we want the presser foot to automatically pivot up? I say yes. I like that function. Most people say yes. Most people actually like the function. And it also helps because if you've been with Bernina for years, you might be used to using that knee control, right? The knee control would be to help you turn. So it would raise the presser foot when the needle is down. We don't have to use that anymore. You can still use it. It's still a part of the machine. They still have it, the capability, but um, it seems silly to me now in these modern machines to go back to using that kind of older technology because I can have the machine do it for us. So when I go here and I select, I'm gonna select this one. So it's two different heights, really high or kind of medium. I always choose the, the medium one, but it's all, all your preference. So now, you will see what happens when we sew. So let me change the camera view again. And again, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to select needle down on my display here. So now we're gonna sew needle down position. So now I'm gonna start sewing and I'm gonna stop. See what happened? The presser foot raised. It raises every time the needle goes into the fabric, the presser foot is gonna jog up. If I'm sewing appliques, this is going to save me a lot of time. I am not reaching for levers, I am not hitting buttons. Um, it is great if I am chain piecing. This is fantastic for chain piecing. There's lots of great reasons why we want this function turned on. So my preference is to have that function turned on. 
So let's go back now to our display. I'm actually going to leave it turned on on this one. So I'm not going to set it back to how it was before, but we're going to go back into our tools here, back to our buttons. So again, that is where we activated that. So now um, I talked about a button over here that was our stop button that did a single pattern and then it would stop after a single pattern. Now we can customize that and I do like to customize this. So I will have this customized to do a lock stitch for me automatic. So I'm going to have it customized to lock, then it's going to cut and then it's going to raise the presser foot for me. I like all those functions turned on. But again, you know, like I said, this is your machine to customize. So let's hit this X and I'm going to change the camera view. And so this right here is the button I'm going to be hitting. So actually, maybe I can move the camera so you can see me hit the button. All right, so I'm sewing. And when I get to the end of my seam, I can hit that button. It's going to do a lock and then it's going to cut and it's going to raise the presser foot. So that is customizing that button right there. So it'll do, if I was doing a pattern stitch like a flower, it would do, if I ever activate this button as I'm sewing the flower, it's always gonna wait until the entire pattern is finished, that entire flower is finished before it would cut and lock and do all those other things. But because I'm on a straight stitch, a straight stitch, every stitch is its own pattern. So it's gonna immediately do that, that command when I hit the button. So when I'm sewing a lot, I will use this a lot at the end of my seams instead of hitting my, my other buttons because it's gonna do all of those functions for me all at the same time. All right, so now we went through our tools and basically at this point, we have really gone through um, the machine. There is, uh, not much else in there to really talk about. There's always a few other little hidden jewels in there. I know um, this button I kind of skipped over. This is a view of your stitch. So if you're doing a pattern, it's going to show you the entire pattern. It's going to get rid of the presser foot. It's just so you can see more of what's going on on, on the screen by giving you that bigger view of, of the stitch that you're you're sewing on. So that's that's what that is. Um, but yeah, we've gone through everything on the machine, which is super exciting. I know this is a, a long class, but when you watch the entire video, you really get a lot of great knowledge out of your machine. The last thing that we are going to finish up with is the Bernina stitch regulator. But before we get to the stitch regulator, I want to talk a little bit about the presser feet. So I'm going to change my camera view because I want you to see the difference between the regular foot and the dual feed feet. So the regular foot is what is going to come on the machine uh, when you take it out of the box. So this foot is your standard sewing foot. It is your 1C foot. You can see it printed on the foot. So this is the way Bernina's feet have looked for a long time, many, many years, really, really standard. But now Bernina's have a really great feature. They have a built-in walking foot. So it's a it's an, an integrated uh, dual feed feature that will uh, have an extra set of feed teeth that work from the top side of the fabric. So you can see I just brought down the walking foot. So that is the walking foot off. That is the integrated walking foot on. The great thing with having this walking foot is that it works with the lower feed perfectly in sync to pull your fabric through at the exact same time from the top and bottom. So that means when you're doing your piecing work, you can work with less pins, your fabric is not gonna shift as much, and it's feed, it, the feed is gonna be so much better than it was in the past with, uh, with previous model machines. So it's a really great feature to have built onto your machine, but in order to use it, it works with different feet. So it works with these feet. You can see these feet are big and hollow in the middle. That is to accommodate the built-in walking foot. And all of the feet that work with the walking foot are going to have a D on them for dual feed. This is a one, whoops, this is a one D foot. So that's how you know this is a dual feed foot, but it's really easy to identify because all the dual feed feet are wide in the back instead of being a single stock in the middle. So when we put on one of the dual feed feet, we just attach it like any of the other. 
And then we bring down the dual feed. And now that part of the machine is activated here. I'll sew a stitch so you can see it. So that dual feed is pulling the fabric from the top side, along with the feed teeth at the bottom, pulling along from the bottom side. So really is quite a fantastic feature. I know it's not talked about a lot in the video because it's, it's very simple and very elegant. Um, and in its simplicity, it is some one of the best features that you can have built onto a sewing machine. It'll really transform your sewing. So it is fantastic. So, okay, so now it's time to get into the BSR. All right, so this is the BSR that comes with the machine. It is the Bernina Stitch Regulator. You can see that written there. Comes in a nice little tin. Has a pretty hefty instruction book, but you really probably don't need it. It's pretty simple to run. So we take the BSR out like this. The BSR has a few different other feet attachments that you can decide to put on it, an open toe. I think it's more like an echo quilting one. So you can switch out the little foot attachment on it just by hitting the release button and, and pulling forward. But um, I like to work with this one, so we're going to um, start by working with this one. So the BSR attaches like any of the other feet attach. Just like that. Now the BSR has a plug-in, looks like a headphone jack. There is a spot in the back of the machine right back here that it plugs in. So when I plug the BSR into the machine, look at what the machine does. Well, the machine is now prompting me because it knows that I just plugged the BSR in. I didn't have to activate anything. I didn't have to hit any other buttons. It already knows. So what it is telling me to do is to lower my feed teeth using the button on the side of the machine. So now I lowered the feed teeth and that prompt has gone away. And you're gonna notice that we can see a picture of the BSR on the screen and it says BSR right there. So the BSR has a few different modes. We are gonna start in mode one and then we'll go to, to mode two and three. That way you can see the difference between the two modes. So I'm gonna leave it on one. I'm gonna reposition the, the camera so you can see the free motion. All right, so this is BSR mode one. So I just hit the foot control to activate it. And you'll see I have the alarm turned on. So you can see that if I start moving a little bit too fast, which I'll do right now, see how it starts, the red light starts flashing and you can hear the beep. That is telling me to slow down a little bit for the BSR. But what the BSR does is it regulates the stitches to keep the stitch length the same length throughout the free motion quilting. And I can adjust how long I want that length by adjusting my stitch length dial will make the stitches longer. Of course, I'm moving the fabric by hand. And so what the machine is doing is it's regulating how fast it runs the machine based on how fast I'm moving the fabric to keep the stitches uh, regulated or at the same length. So that is BSR one. So let me change the camera view. So now we are going to go to BSR number two. So now I just touched two. So BSR two acts a little bit different. So let me actually go back to BSR one really quick. I wanna show you something. So BSR one, again, when I hit the foot control, even if I'm not moving the fabric, the needle is moving. So the needle always is moving when we're in BSR one. So now we go to BSR two. BSR2 is a precision mode. So a precision mode means that the needle doesn't move until I start moving the fabric. Even though I'm still pushing on the foot control, when I stop moving the fabric, the needle stops moving. Why this is called precision is because sometimes when you're doing your free motion, you need to stop for a minute and you need to think about where you're going to move next. 
And so by giving yourself that opportunity to stop and not have the needle keep moving, um, gives you that little bit uh, more precision. So it really depends on the kind of free motion you're doing. If I am going to be meandering a whole quilt, I will probably be in BSR one because it's better to have your needle always moving to keep the flow nice. When you're on BSR two and you're in precision mode, I would definitely use this if I'm doing patterns, if I'm trying to make a star or whatever, or a flower. Um, I need, or if I'm even trying to follow a ditch, I wanna be thinking about my next turn and move or how the pattern's gonna turn out. So I need that break for a second to think about the next direction I'm gonna go in. Now, when you're on BSR two, you have to be a little bit more cautious on how you're starting and stopping your BSR. Because if I'm on BSR two and I go to move my fabric and I'm kind of aggressive with how I am moving my fabric, I might get an inconsistently long stitch, longer than my other stitches. So um, if I take my fabric and I go like this and like this and like this, well, guess what? Um, my stitches here are longer than my stitches were over here because I am not giving the machine a chance to catch up to my movements. So when I'm on BSR two, I want to start slow each time. So if I stop and then and the needle stops moving and I start moving again, I'm starting at a fairly slow pace and then I can pick up speed afterwards. So that is BSR one and BSR2, then we have three. So now three is only for basting purposes. So BSR1 and two is for doing your free motion and three would be if you are going to baste your quilt. So let's go to three and you will see what happens now when I'm running it. So you can see that it's doing a really long, um, a really long basting stitch instead of running a normal free motion type stitch. So, um, so that you can do your basting work. So that is BSR three. Okay, so there's a few other things to know on the BSR. Um, one is we have a, a new kickstart feature. Uh, when I say it's new, it was new with a software update a little while ago. So if you have a Bernina 770 and you are looking on your screen and you do not see this symbol, um, you need a software update. It's a free update. Uh, as soon as you update it, you'll get the kickstart feature. So what happens on the kickstart feature? So we are going to go to, I'll go to BSR1 and I'm going to activate kickstart. So if you look at it, it's a symbol of your foot healing back on the foot control. Because you remember our foot control can do commands when we heal back. So when I hit that, the machine is gonna pop up and say to start the BSR, we need to do the kickback feature. What this is going to do is it's going to run the machine without me having to keep my foot on the foot control. So all I have to do is heal back. Now I heal back, that starts the machine running and my foot is not on the foot control at all. And when I'm ready to stop, I just heal on, I just touch the foot control again with my foot and then it stops. So it kind of saves my foot uh, if I'm getting a little bit tired of having to keep my foot on the foot control. The thing to know with the BSR is you are not regulating the speed the machine is running with the foot control. You are just hitting your foot, putting your foot on the foot control to activate the BSR running and the machine then regulates the speed. You do not, so you don't run it the same way as you do when you're doing regular sewing. All right, so that is a kickstart feature on the BSR. Of course, we talked about we can change our stitch length for the BSR if we want. You'll see the length on the screen change if you need your stitch length uh, a little bit longer. Um, the other thing to know is you can use the Bernina stitch regulator foot in an unregulated mode. So if we want to turn off the regulation and we just want to run it at a set speed, or maybe we are varying the speed now with the foot control, we can hit this button that will turn off the stitch regulation. And so I can still run the machine then. Um, it is just going to run at one set speed. There's not, I, I don't think there's a lot of people who do that um, because they're one of the reasons why you buy the Bernina is you want 
the built-in stitch regulation. That's why we are spending the money and getting such a great machine that does this feature. So, but if you do have the option, so Bernina, of course, gives you a lots of options for the machine because everybody does things a little bit, a little bit different in their sewing. The other thing too, let me turn this screen back. The other thing they give you the ability to, to do is if you want to do zigzags in your free motion settings, you can. Um, I don't think there's a lot of people that do this, but you can actually do um, kind of some old fashioned type of like monogram um, stitches. How good I am at There you go. So you can also do um, zigzag in your free motion with your BSR. All right. Well, thank you for taking the class and taking the time with us. I, like I said before, I know this is a long video, but it is so important to us at Village Sewing to make sure that everybody is well educated on their machine. The more you know about the machine, the easier you're going to have to run the machine and you're just going to have a better overall user experience. So that is all of the running of the machine. So now the last thing that we have to do now is we are going to do the maintenance part of the machine. So that is uh, that's an important part because we need to know how to take care of our machine. And there is a few different steps into in, in the maintenance section. So let's me change the camera angle and we're going to do that together. All right, welcome to the maintenance section on the machine. So we're going to talk about how we're going to maintain our machine on a daily basis. And the Berninas, we do want to make sure that we're maintaining them. We want to keep the lint out of them and we want to keep them well lubricated. And, in, you know, we are going to do our maintenance, but that doesn't excuse you from going to your dealer and have them do their bigger maintenance. The bigger maintenance, it really depends on how much you sew, on how often you are going to get your bigger maintenance done um, at your dealer. Uh, I reckon this is usually what I tell my customers is if you are an extremely heavy sewer, meaning that you are sewing every single day or close to that, which we have a lot of customers do, they usually get their machines in once a year or maybe a little bit more often than that and to have it opened and maintained. The average sewer, we're going to say they're going to maintain their machine uh, at a dealer about every every year and a half to two years. So it really depends on, on how often and the kind of sewing you do. But your job is to take care of your oiling when you're running the machine. So to do that, some of the some of the things with how we oil the machines have changed. So if you have an earlier model B770, the way that we're oiling them now may not be the way that you oiled it back then. So this is gonna be some updated information for you. So what I would want you to do is every day that you're gonna run the machine, you are going to pop off, whoops, whoop, that away from me. You are gonna pop off your presser foot. Then you are going to pop off your stitch plate. To remove the stitch plate on the Berninas, you just push on the little um, corner where the little bullseye is, the plate pops up, and then you pull the plate off like that, really easy. So what you are gonna do then is you're going to take your little brush, and you're going to remove any lint that you see from inside the machine. You are not going to use canned air that just damages the machine. You are just going to use your brush and you are not going to be too aggressive. So these parts in here are part of your cutter assembly and we do not want to be poking and digging too hard in these areas because we may end up damaging our cutter and we absolutely don't want to do that. So a brush is we just brush this out. The machine comes with a brush. This is my paint brush. So um, I'm probably actually getting it oily, uh, which I don't want to do because I actually paint with that brush. So, okay. So we get all our little, little stuff out of the machine. And so the way that I tell people to do this is this is a very simple way to keep your machine oiled on a daily basis. I like people to do the oil, a drop right from the top, so where you're going to be shooting for is if you turn your hand wheel, you can see the moving part there. That is the top of your shuttle hook right there. It's a silver piece that is rotating around. 
you can put a drop of oil anywhere on that part. It doesn't matter where. You just put one drop of oil. And then um, when that part turns, actually, I think I missed it, which is fine. Uh, it's not going to hurt those other parts either. But when it turns, it's because I have a camera in my face. Um, but when it rotates, it is going to then rotate the oil all around the shuttle system. So that whole raceway will then be lubricated just by putting one drop boop, at the top of that shuttle hook. Then you can pop your stitch plate back on. And you are back up and, and running, right? So, so that is really fast and easy. I pop off my plate. Again, I go dust, dust, dust. One small drop. And I put my plate on. That took me all of 30 seconds. And my machine has been maintained for the day. Very, very easy to do a very quick daily maintenance, right? So I'm saying daily because this is what I would like you to do when you're going to take out the machine to start sewing on it for the day, right? Okay, so now let's talk about uh, a little bit more involved oil that we are absolutely going to do, and that is when we take our shuttle pieces apart. So I would say I would like you to do this. I usually tell people if they're doing the other daily one, uh, maybe about every two bobbin changes, they can do the other one. So um, you don't have to do it quite as, as often anymore. So some things have changed. Another thing that has changed too, if you have an older 770, there used to be a red hole right there and they used to tell you to oil that hole. If you notice on the new ones, there is no red oil hole located here. That hole does not go anywhere, by the way, if that's what you're thinking, that is not an oil hole. Um, that oil hole is now gone. They do not use that anymore. Uh, they do not want you using it. That does not uh, does not work out for the, the best. So, um, so that is now not a part of oiling the machine. Okay. So now we're going to do the bigger one. And again, the bigger one, we are going to do this about every other bobbin change. So we're going to open up our door. We are going to remove our bobbin case. I might actually pop this off just so a little bit more light is shining down in there. And you can see it. That doesn't have to necessarily be off. But OK, so we've got our shuttle. This is where the bobbin case clicks in. So we have a release for it here. So we're going to hit the release button and this is going to pop down like this. Very easy. Then we are going to grab our shuttle hook. Just grab it by the middle post and it is going to pull out. So this is our shuttle hook. This has to get lubricated. Um, I'm going to get my little pointer because I want to point out a few things here that are is important to know. In here, there is little felt pads in these circles on either side and right there. These felt pads hold the oil. I have had a few customers think that is lint that is being trapped in their machine and they take the time to dig out that felt pad and they ruin the shuttle hook. So do not do that. That is a part of this shuttle. It is designed to be there. So what they want you to do is they want you to oil that shuttle pad because as the shuttle is spinning around in a circle, oil is going to then fly out of that pad just a tiny amount as it's turning to help keep the raceway lubricated as the machine is running. So what I do is at my very start of doing my big cleaning is the first thing is I do is I take out my shuttle hook then I put my shuttle hook down and I take my oiler and I start to oil the felt pads. I do that at the start so that that oil can sit on those little pads for a little while and really soak in really well. So I just put oil on both those little holes. So now what I can do then is I could clean, 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 dust, dust, dust. And the other thing they want you to do is they want you to put a drop of oil on the raceway. So the raceway is the part that the shuttle hook turns in this metal rim right here. The shuttle hook is, is running around that in a circle, right? And there's friction there if it's metal against metal. So they want that lubricated. That is the same raceway that we lubricate when we do the drop on the top, because essentially we put a drop on the top here on the shuttle 
and that is going to end up lubricating that entire raceway. So we do that on, on, on a very regular basis when we do the other maintenance. But when you take out this whole shuttle system, they want you to do the dust, then before you put it in, they want the drop of oil on the raceway, and then we can reinsert the shuttle hook. So now what you need to know about reinserting the shuttle hook, one is the shuttle hook is magnet. It's a magnet, so you can feel it against there. So it's gonna to wanna to kind of magnet in when it finds its right spot. How you know to find its right spot is there is a hole here and there is a white dot on the back of the shuttle right there. The hole lines up with that white dot. They have to be lined up with each other. So there's only two ways that the shuttle would possibly snap in. So either the hole is lined up with the white here or it's the exact opposite, straight up from that. There is no in between. So you don't have to worry about, oh, did I get it exactly right? If it was in the vicinity and it snapped in, it's, it's right. All right, so we're gonna take this and you just kind of aim towards the, the white dot. And then what I usually do is I get my fingers and I start to kind of wiggle it around a little bit and you'll feel it snap into place. Once it snaps into place, it's held in there. I could turn the hand wheel and it's gonna turn, right? It is, it is actually magneted, magneted into the holder there. So once we get that snapped in, then we just lift this up. We push that. We can take our bobbin case then. We can reinsert it into the machine like that. We can put back our stitch plate and we are all done with that bigger oil. When we are also dusting our machine, this is a sensor that is a part of this door. That sensor is what reads the movement of the bobbin. These little glass, they look like little glass beads that are in there. Those are all important to be cleaned to make sure there is no dust on those. If these get clogged with dust or lint, then the machine is not gonna be reading your bobbin properly. And you might get messages on the screen telling you you're running out of bobbin thread or, or making you think there's a problem with your bobbin when there's not. It's just simply that we have to clean those sensors on the door. All right, so we've done some pretty big maintenances, right? We've done our, our, our little one, but then we did the big one. We pulled out the shuttle hook, we oiled the pad, cleaned it all up and put it back together. Now, the last thing that we have to do is we have to do our cutter cleaning. We talked about this a little bit earlier. These cutter assemblies need to be cleaned out of lint. I think that the cutter should be done at the same time that we're doing the bigger oil. So when we are popping these pieces apart and taking out the shuttle at the exact same time, I'm gonna do my, sh my, my shuttle cleaning. So, and again, I'm doing that at about every other bobbin change. So now, to do the shuttle, the, the cutter cleaning, we have to get there through our tools menu on our screen. So let me change the camera view here. So I can show you where we're gonna go and then I'll show you what's gonna happen here. So we're gonna go to our tools. We are gonna go to the sewing machine. We're gonna go to the wrench and then we're gonna go to this brush. This is our cleaning brush. So when we touch that, it's gonna give us directions. It's gonna say cleaning the thread catcher. The thread catcher is the thread cutter. It just means the thread cutter has to go out and catch the thread and pull it over to the blade to cut it. So this is cleaning our thread cutter assembly. It says the thread catcher needs to be cleaned frequently from any lint. Frequently, of course, means we're gonna do this on a regular basis. That's what they're telling you when they use the word frequently. So we're gonna follow all the steps. Step one, remove the presser foot from the machine. So we've taken the presser foot off. We are going to hit the button on the side of the machine to lower the feed dogs, and we are going to remove the needle plate. The next thing it says is on step two, it says touch the automatic scissor button. That is not gonna be on the screen. They are talking about the actual scissor button. So we are gonna to touch the scissor button. So what has happened when we touch the scissor button, that cutter here has come all the way out. It is completely exposed. Usually when we touch the scissor button is it goes out and then comes back and it cuts. Um, this time it's stuck out so that most, the most of it's exposed so that we can clean anything that we see building up in it. So we wanna clean, clean, clean this fairly regularly because 
When too much lint gets trapped in the cutter, the cutter will stop working. So just please make sure that you do this on a regular basis. Okay, so now we hit the, we hit the cutter, the cutter went out, we, we took our time to clean it. We didn't jab anything in there. We didn't pry, but we definitely got it cleaned. Now, if we look back over on the screen, it says step three is touch the cutter again. So we touch the cutter button again. Now the cutter went back home and guess what? We are done. That is all that has to happen. It's going to tell us to put our parts back on and we hit the check mark and we are absolutely done. So that is how we are going to be. That's how we're going to maintain our, our Bernina. So just to recap, when you're going to sew on the machine, I want you to pop off your stitch plate and I want you to put a drop of oil on the top of the raceway. And after you have dusted out the lint and you're going to reattach your plate and then you're going to sew for the day about every other bobbin change, you're going to take these components apart, you're going to oil the felt pad, you're going to put it back together, and you're going to do your cutter cleaning. If you do these things for your machine, your Bernina is going to be very happy and it's going to very much like you for it. If you forget how to do your bigger oil, we can hit this icon here and it's going to give you step-by-step -step instructions on oiling your Bernina. And you're going to see, see the little pad that got oiled and then it all goes back together. See that? Talks about cleaning it. So that is the maintenance section of the video. And that is it. We are at the end of our video. I hope you have gotten a lot out of it. Have a good day.